Hey everyone, today I wanted to do a video talking about a topic I don't think gets enough attention, regardless uh, of what efforts I might put into that, and that is carrying medical supplies on your person in what will hopefully be a convenient way. Now, I know a lot of us, or at least a lot of you watching this channel, um, may be used to carrying a firearm on a daily basis, and I think that is a very important thing to do. However, I think a extremely overlooked aspect of carrying a firearm is carrying medical supplies. If I am prepared to be putting holes in somebody, there's a good chance that either myself or someone with me might get holes in them, and I need to be able to address that. On top of that, there are plenty of other contexts in which I can find myself having to apply medical aid completely detached from the firearms world. Uh, car accidents, workplace injuries, anything like that. There's a lot of scenarios in which you might need to be able to apply medical aid to someone and having important tools on your person is going to make that far easier. Now, Obviously, none of the stuff going that we're going to go over here matters unless you actually have training and know how to use it. So obviously, the first step of anything like that is going to be to get some sort of medical training, whether it be like American Red Cross, which has a level of training, although they usually discourage the use of tourniquets, as we'll get to here in a second. However, um, there are plenty of places that offer some sort of combat medicine, um, TCCC, anything like that, stuff that is going to train you on the proper use of these tools and allow you to be better prepared to hopefully save your life or the lives of someone you love. So what I'm going to be going over is the main way that I have carried medical supplies as well as a secondary way to carry medical supplies if this isn't going to work for you. Um, and just kind of go over what I carry. This is not an exhaustive kit. This is an ankle kit, so there's only so much I can pack around my ankle. Um, but let's go ahead and dig into it. So first of all, what am I using to actually carry the supplies? So this is actually the Ricky ankle kit from Strike Industries. Uh, now I know some people out there might uh, want to say that this name should be pronounced in a different way. This is how the guy himself pronounces it. So Ricky it is. Um, but this is obviously worn around your ankle. They do have other kits designed for other locations of carry. However, I find that the ankle to be a very convenient place for that. Um, now, this thing does use a Velcro style of attachment. So I can just wrap this around my ankle. It's got some uh, softer material here on the inside to help uh, not be too abrasive against the inside of your leg. And then you've also got um, some almost like tacky or more textured material to keep it from moving around on you too much. Now, I do recommend, I guess right off the bat, that if you're going to be using an ankle rig like this, to wear taller socks so that this isn't going directly onto your skin, especially in the case of the tourniquet that I have here with the um, Velcro, uh, the male end of the Velcro facing inboard to my leg that I definitely start noticing rubbing on my leg if I don't have a sock pulled up in the way. So, um, I, and for what it's worth, I've been using this ankle kit for a very long time, definitely over a year, um, and it has served me exceptionally well. Uh, a lot of the people that come into the, the store where I work, the, the gun store where I work, who ask me about medical kits have seen this because I'll just pull this off of my ankle uh, and it just makes it a very convenient way to carry these supplies on me if I don't have cargo pockets or anything else to be able to put them in. Um, so let's just go ahead and run down the list of items that I have and I'm going to try to link all of this stuff down below to the best of my ability so you guys can find out where to go to find this. I did briefly discuss this in one of my recent Q&A videos, but again, we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into this now. So first of all, we have an H&H &H, um, cutter here. This is what they call their Clever Cutter. It's basically like trauma shears, however, obviously much lower profile, much smaller almost like a seatbelt cutter in profile. And this is designed to allow you to cut clothing off of a person without risking, you know, if you're using a pocket knife, accidentally cutting the person as well. Obviously, if they are already injured, already bleeding, whatever else, I don't want to be adding injuries to that list of things that I need to address. And this should allow me to be able to remove that clothing from the you know, necessary area without adding any more injuries. And again, this thing is super, super thin, super low profile and tucks into 
one of the pockets on this thing very easily. Um, now, if you wanted to carry combat shears, you could, or trauma shears, you could. However, um, when we're talking about something that is designed to conform around your ankle, not all of our ankles are uh, super thick. Some of ours are a little bit skinnier. Some of them are a little bit thicker. So you kind of have to find what works for you. But I think that these, this clever cutter here from H&H &H is a really um, convenient way of carrying some method of cutting away clothing. Now, we kind of have a main compartment here. This is protected by a Velcro strap. And the cool thing, <laughs> puff of nice, uh, I'm not gonna go into what that could possibly be. Dead skin cells, probably. Uh, and as I pull up on this, you'll notice it also presents out the contents. So I have two things in this main compartment here. The first one is a H&H uh, &H flat compressed Fat compressed gauze. It's basically a roll of gauze, but instead of it being a round roll, it's a flat pack. That way it is going to be, again, a little bit more convenient for tucking inside a clothing like that. If we had a, um, uh, like a large dedicated medical, you know, pouch, that's where the rolled up stuff can be nice. However, flat pack is a lot more convenient for conforming to the side of my leg. So, and I guess just to cover what this would be for, I can use this for various purposes. I can use this to stuff a wound. I can use this to just put dressing on the outside of a wound. Um, this is going basically anything I could be potentially using gauze for. This is what I have. Uh, let's see, specifically, this is uh, four and a half inch by 4.1 yards when stretched. And it is a six ply cotton single use, not something you want to be reusing. Uh, and then I opt generally to keep them in the, um, like vacuum sealed bag that way. A, again, it keeps it a little bit more compact and compressed and B worst case scenario. I can use this as a chest seal. Continuing on with that, uh, also in that pouch, I have an H&H &H mini compression bandage. Now, I swear that this is not an advertisement for H&H. &H. Uh, they just happen to make supplies that I find to be size efficient for this purpose. Now, obviously, a mini compression bandage is not going to be as ideal as a full size like H bandage or Israeli dressing or whatever else you want to use. Um, but something like this is going to uh, allow me to apply pressure to a area without having to uh, be necessarily having someone manually applying that pressure. So especially for an open wound that is bleeding, this is going to allow me to do that. Again, I keep it vacuum sealed so that it stays as sanitary as possible and um, stays nice and compressed. And then also, again, if I had to, theoretically, I could use the wrapper as a chest seal. It does also have directions for use on here. Um, and again, this is going to work a lot better than anything I could improvise. Now, it is worth mentioning that a lot of the tools that I am showing here can be improvised. You know, if I don't have compressed gauze, I can use a t-shirt that I tear up to stuff a wound. I could use a lot of things to replace a lot of these tools. However, in my opinion, none of those things work as well as something purpose built for that task. And again, it's just gonna be a lot easier and a lot, uh, I think, safer and cleaner to use stuff like this instead of those improvised tools. Now, speaking of improvised tools, we'll go ahead and go on to the more commonly uh, stated thing that can be improvised, and that is a tourniquet. So I personally carry a CAT7 tourniquet. I find these to be, I think, some of the best tourniquets on the market, um, and also one of the most cloned um, tourniquets on the market. So, uh, if you're going to be buying, uh, cat seven tourniquets, I highly recommend buying them either from a direct dealer of North American rescue or directly from North American rescue themselves. In fact, when I went to shot show back in 2020, I went to the North American rescue booth and I asked them, Hey, how can you differentiate a North American rescue tourniquet from another fake, uh, uh, cat seven tourniquet and they basically said buy directly from us there a lot of those clones are so good visually that you can't tell the difference however the performance is not even close so don't think hey it's 10 bucks from amazon i'll just get that one because it can't be too bad it looks exactly the same however the strength of things like the windlass and other components are not going to be as strong in those fakes. So it is vitally important that you get the real thing. Now, again, a lot of people say, well, I can use a belt. I can do this. I can do that. 
Now, yeah, we've seen stuff like that used in real world, real, real world situations, um, like at the Vegas shooting. However, I don't think anything, again, works as well as something designed for that purpose. And again, something like this is going to be something I don't have to maintain. I can basically apply it, make sure it's on correctly, and then I can focus on something else. With a belt, someone has to sit there and hold tension on it, and it's just again, not going to be ideal. Um, with the cat tourniquets, I'm gonna try to do the Velcro noise away from my microphone. I try to have it pre-sized for the largest limb that I'm going to be applying it to. So in this case, my thigh, I wanna make sure that I can very easily slip this on over my leg without having to sit and adjust it. If you guys wanna know the actual usage or how to use one of these tourniquets, take a class. Um, I don't really want to bog this video down by explaining how to actually use a Cat7 tourniquet. Uh, take a class, take some training, watch a YouTube video, um, but watching a YouTube video is just a band-aid. Uh, definitely take a training class, but again, I can actually apply this to my uh, leg uh, myself. Obviously, I can size it down for an arm or anything like that and give myself a way of applying um, or hopefully uh, uh, cutting off circulation to a limb that will then prevent me from losing that limb or, or sorry, uh, losing my life. And the risk of losing my limb from a tourniquet is actually low. Uh, one of the things, I remember when I was a full-time student, one of my classmates found out that I carried a tourniquet on me and they were like, well, that's dumb because anytime you put on a tourniquet, you lose the limb. And first of all, that shows kind of an antiquated view of tourniquets because we've obviously proven that that is not the case anymore. However, what that also shows is a, I think, lack of priorities because would you rather lose your life or lose your limb? Because if I don't cut off blood flow to that limb, say I nick my uh, radial artery or my femoral artery or something like that, if I don't address it, if I don't stop the blood flow to that area, I will very likely lose my life. And even if it does mean losing my limb, I would rather have my life than that limb. Maybe not everyone agrees with that, but that's a decision for you to make. And then last but not least in here, I also have a set of gloves. Now, the gloves that I carry, these just happen to be North American Rescue gloves, uh, the store where I work, we, the store where I work, I should probably articulate that better, um, usually has large bags of gloves just already kind of prepackaged and compressed like this. Um, so just for sake of simplicity, I did this. You can obviously use whatever uh, gloves you want. However, what I would recommend is using a light colored glove for any sort of medical uh application. So in this case, they're kind of like a nice beige color. So Lindy Beige would be a fan of that. Um, however, uh, there's also like the light blue medical gloves or nitrile gloves. Basically, you don't want to use black. Um, black gloves look really cool. In fact, I got a box of black gloves there over my shoulder. Works fine when I'm cleaning a firearm or, you know, doing reloading or whatever else. However, the problem with black gloves is when I get any sort of body fluid on it, whether it be spit, blood, urine, whatever else it could be, it all looks the same on a black glove. I can't tell what I'm looking at. So especially if I'm raking someone to see, you know, where their wounds are, if I look at my hands, I'm not going to be able to tell the difference between, you know, water from if it's raining to blood, uh, at least against the glove itself. So having a light colored glove is going to allow me to, you know, rake the person's back, you know, feel whatever I can and then actually see if there's blood on my hands at that point so that I know what sort of situation I'm dealing with. Now that's this kit and I know obviously that there's a lot of things that I'm leaving out. Again, I uh, think something I mentioned in the improvised sense is a chest seal. Um, obviously, my word still stands that an improvised tool is nowhere near as good as a dedicated tool. Um, However, I had to kind of pick and choose priorities um, based on the amount of space that I have available to me. Now, I know there are some very, very small and compact chest seals, so I do want to pursue that option in the future. However, to me, these tools are going to be more, I think, applic applicable to day-to-day -to -day needs. Um, and then I, and I think the improvised chest seal 
um, ideally will work better than an improvised tourniquet or something like that. Another thing that I'm missing out on here is an NPA or nasal pharyngeal airway, basically a way to open up someone's airway and bypass their mouth if they have some sort of mouth injury or some sort of tongue thing going on that basically allows, it forces air, um, it basically forces their way into their windpipe just by bypassing their mouth altogether and going through the nose. Not a very pleasant thing to have put in. Um, However, again, it's going to be more important that you are able to get air to your lungs than it is to have the slight discomfort of having something kind of slimy going down your nose, at least if inserted properly. Um, so that is one option. This is the main option that I use. Again, whether I'm wearing cargo pants or jeans or anything else, this is what is typically going to be on my person at least 99% of the time. Now there are going to be some considerations you have to do, like I already mentioned, socks. I typically will wear longer socks, even if I'm wearing low cut shoes. That way the, the, the tourniquet especially isn't touching my bare skin. However, the other thing you're going to have to take into consideration is the type of pants you're wearing. So obviously if you're into wearing skinny jeans, this is not going to work. Um, the jeans that I typically wear are loose fit um, jeans, so they're pretty forgiving around the ankle. So um, that's obviously something you're going to have to take into consideration. And usually the cargo pants that I'm wearing, whether it be from uh, like True Spec or LA Police Gear or anything like that, um, they are going to allow for me to have this as well. Now, one of the drawbacks to something like this is if I'm wearing shorts, it's going to look a little bit goofy. Or if I'm wearing boots or something like that that is a little bit higher cut, it might be a little bit harder to actually get this on. So I do have an alternate way of carrying medical supplies in those situations. Now, if I'm wearing boots, there's a good chance that I'm wearing um, some sort of cargo pant that is going to allow me to tuck medical supplies just directly into the cargo pockets. However, something I have adopted recently uh, that I used to poo-poo on pretty hard is the fanny pack. So this fanny pack is currently set up with all of the same stuff minus the uh, clever cutter, the little clothing cutter. Um, but you can, you know, this is big enough where I can fit trauma, regular trauma shears in here, no problem. But I've got, now I've got quick clot, I've got a couple other things in addition to what you saw on that one that I can actually fit more in here. Now, I know some of you out there have a lot of opinions on fanny packs. I get that. Um, however, it, I have to admit now that I'm actually integrating these things, these things are super duper convenient. I can carry a lot of stuff in here without it, you know, being big and heavy and awkward. And, um, again, it's just a way for me to be able to carry stuff in a not super like, um, you know, Hey, look at me, I'm tactical kind of way. Um, while still again, maintaining, having good readiness. And to me, that readiness is an extremely important thing. And, what I tell a lot of people, they say, well, why do you, like, why do you carry supplies like that? Why, why would you inconvenience, inconvenience yourself? Why would you have something that uncomfortable on you? Which again, once you get used to, it, it's really not that uncomfortable. And the thing that I tell everyone is, you know, I, I am a person that takes training. I want to be as prepared of an individual as possible and as, as self-reliant of an individual as possible. And, you know, I carry a firearm on me. So if, again, if I'm prepared to put holes in someone, I should be prepared to treat holes in me or in others. And basically what it comes down to is since I've taken training and I have some of the skills necessary to be able to apply, uh, you know, first aid to something like that, I never ever want to find myself in a position where I have to watch someone I love die. Like, you know, I'm, I'm married now. And if I, if I had to watch my wife or someone else that I love die, knowing that I have the skills to help them, but I don't have the tools on me to do that. I don't know if I could live with myself, basically having to watch this person die, knowing I could help, but because I was lazy or I was inconvenienced by what I was doing. Now I'm in this situation where I now lose that person I love and there's nothing I could do. Now, obviously I would try to use improvised tools the best I can, but realistically speaking, I want to make sure I never have to find my, that, myself in that position by carrying medical supplies on me. And again, I'm going to harp on this a lot. Training is vitally important to this. And the reality is there's a lot more and more places 
making training like this available. For those of you here in Oregon, I know places like the Task Collective up near Portland offer stuff like this. Northwest Self-Defense Education offers stuff like this more centralized here in the state. Uh, Rogue Protection Group offers stuff like this down in Grants Pass. So there's a lot of options available. They also teach over out east for those of you further in that direction. But there's a lot more that I'm sure I'm not even aware of offering classes like this. So please, please take some training, find out what you know, most importantly, find out what you don't know, how to apply these skills. And hopefully if you do ever find yourself in this position, whether it's you rolling up on a car accident, uh, or, you know, somewhere in, in your workplace getting injured by equipment, or you defending your life with a firearm and having to patch up those around you or yourself that you will be prepared for that situation. So I know that got a little bit more of a uh, put on a serious tone there, but again, this is something I think is vitally important. So like I said, I will have links to all this stuff down below, anything linked to Amazon. Um, I'm going to try to avoid doing be just because of the potential risk in fake stuff out there. Um, but most of what I'm going to be linking to uh, is either going to be affiliate linking. Uh, so I do get a little bit of a kickback from that if you go that route. Obviously, if you don't want to support the channel financially, you are more than welcome to Google search any of these parts uh, individually and source them that way. That is totally your prerogative. Uh, but if you're following links below, it is possible that it will be an affiliate link for the ones that that is applicable to. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, if you have any recommendations for pieces of kit that I don't have included in this, but you would recommend me having available, definitely let me know. I am always trying to better this kit and refine this kit and find things that make myself a little bit more capable or a little bit more ready. So please give me your recommendations down below. Uh, but anyway, with all that being said, as always, I hope you got something out of this video and I really appreciate you watching.